So I'm going to bring up uh, Thomas Clayton uh, from Bubble Motion first. Uh, big round of applause for Tom, everybody. He's a uh, really uh, excellent example of a foreign entrepreneur who set up shop here in Singapore and really benefited from uh, the, all, all that Singapore has to offer around that. He's going to be moderating the panel. We have five panelists, uh, all from uh, uh, different geographies that are going to uh, give us insights. Uh, first up, let's bring back uh, Kitagawa-san from Cyber Agent, representing sort of China slash Japan. He was on a panel, uh, he was a judge yesterday. Uh, Sangi Paul, uh, venture advisor, representing sort of Singapore and India. Round of applause for him, please, thank you. Uh, Jamie Lin, Jamie, where's Jamie? Jamie, representing Taiwan. Welcome back to the stage. Um, my old buddy from Hong Kong, from the dot-com boom days, representing the Curiously Fragrant Harbor, Casey Lau. Working with SoftLayer, who's uh, providing uh, cloud hosting for startups. And last but not least, uh, certainly not my fellow compatriot from Beijing, the lovely northern capital representing Innovation Works, Chris Evdemon, everybody. Give it up. Thank you. Over to you, Tom. Okay, thanks, uh, Richard. Let's uh, go ahead and jump right in. Uh, as Richard pointed out, we are fortunate enough today to have someone from pretty much every major region around, uh, around Asia. Uh, so I kind of wanted to break you guys up into those groups and, and get your perspective on your uh, respective uh, ecosystems. Now, while I know some of you are based in Beijing, you come from Japan and you're Japanese at heart, so uh, you'll have to represent your home country but, uh, and don't have to represent Greece, but if you could tell us a, a foreigner's perspective on China, that would be great. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and just walk through and, and uh, as part of your intro on, on who you are, just tell us a bit about the, the ecosystem in your uh, respective home countries. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. The, my name is Nobuaki Kitagawa from the Cyber Edge Ventures. Uh, the Cyber Edge Ventures is the you know internet industry forecast uh, the VC firm. Uh, right now, the, we are operating the VC business the, not only in Japan actually, but uh, mainland China and Taiwan and Vietnam, Indonesia, as well as South Korea. Uh, actually, the, the I oversee the, the all of our investment actually outside Japan. Uh, but uh, you know, the, today's my role. That should be the Japanese market. Uh, and in terms of the, the you know the current ecosystem of the Japanese startup community, I think right now the, the, I think the same trend as other market. Like more and more, you know, the seed investors and accelerator kinds of people are increasing so much. And uh, because of that kind of trend, also the kind of the more established the big corporation like uh, you know telecom carriers or some you know the broadcasting company these companies also the gra gradually you know the, the putting their money into the startups so that the, of course compare with like uh, in the US or China uh, still you know the chi uh, the Japanese you know venture capital the, the community or the startup community is maybe a bit smaller but I think particularly in the last few years the you know the change the is the very very uh, very uh, obvious, actually. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I currently work with startups as an independent investment advisor, but uh, a lot of my early investments and incubations have been done in India, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. If you think of India, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the one, one billion plus market out there. So the obvious uh, uh, way of thinking about India is that uh, it's a great domestic market. There's a huge market for consumer businesses. But what we've seen over the last five years in particular is that there have been three distinct hype cycles around consumer internet businesses. First, the mobile value-added services, then the whole group on copycats. And over the last two years, we saw a lot of e-commerce companies coming up. And in all three cycles, what we saw was that there were a lot of these MeToo companies coming in, a couple of companies did a land grab and there was consolidation of the industry and people eventually figured out that there's a huge consumer market, that's the upside. The downside is that payments is broken, logistics is broken, last mile is not working. So the consumer market is huge, it's just too difficult to serve. So the real trend that I see now over the last two years is that there's 
a global first and a global next mentality that's coming in India that building out of India, you're not going to be targeting just the Indian market, you can also target the global market. And that's primarily because there have been a few success stories that have come up uh, in the last two years in particular. First, we had Inmobi, which proved everyone wrong by building a global first business headquartered out of India. Then we had SlideShare being acqui acquired by LinkedIn, very much a valley company, but operations based out of India. We have Zoho, which com continues to compete with Salesforce, despite having no venture funding, totally bootstrapped, extremely profitable, completely based out of India. So we've seen these two or three models working out where a company based out of India is delivering to the global market. And the third thing that we see now is people moving away from a consumer focus actually going for enterprise software, going uh, into enterprise SaaS, going into a B2B model. And there again, what we see is that the, the real paying market for enterprise software is not in India, it's in the US. So a lot of these companies are the, uh, moving to the US. Those who target the media buying audience like ad networks are moving to Singapore. So there's a huge wave, while the consumer market continues to be attractive, there's a huge wave of start in India, go global. And that's the real wave that I see right now in India. Uh, so in terms of Taiwan, I think we covered a little bit uh, yesterday with uh, the chat with Willis. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, a little bit to that uh, in that I think Taiwan is a pretty decent sized uh, test market for a lot of consumer plates. If you, uh, if you want to uh, sort of establish uh, working business model there and try to take that and expand, expand that to the, uh, the rest of Asia. Um, Taiwan's e-commerce market is at around uh, 50 billion a year, US dollars, growing at around 20%. Uh, it's uh, online advertising is around uh, 400 million a year, uh, also growing at around 20%. It's uh, web-based, browser-based gaming is around 200 million a year, growing uh, at 100% over last year. It's uh, mobile gaming, app-based gaming is gonna become a $200 million business this year, growing at around uh, 300 to 400% over last year. So it's a pretty decent sized uh, internet economy where you can build and test your business model and then take it uh, somewhere else. And another thing is it's uh, the, the local um, engineering talent is right now relatively cheaper even compared to uh, China, or even you know, Shanghai and Beijing. You can hire an uh, you know, engineer right out of uh, a, a tier one college at around uh, 15,000 US dollars a year. Uh, for a three to five years experience, programmer uh, around 25 to 35,000 a year. So it's really reasonably priced. Another uh, advantage of uh, the Taiwanese startup scene is our uh, IPO market is pretty stable. So uh, over the past 10 years, every year, there's at least 25 uh, companies that, getting, that are getting listed. So as a, as a you know, if you're, you're an investor, you know, uh, right now, you know, for example, in China, we're seeing a lot of qualified company not being able to uh, go public, and it's creating a huge issue for all the venture investors, whereas in Taiwan, you know, we sort of have a more stable capital market. So that's, uh, I think, you know, how, how I, I would describe Taiwan as a startup environment. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Casey Lau. I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm one of the co-founders of a startup group called Startups HK. So if you come to Hong Kong and you want to find out what's happening, come and, come and check us out. Um, so we started this group about three and a half years ago. Um, you know, Dave McClure came to Hong Kong and did an angel talk and basically told us to get together afterwards and start a little ecosystem, which we did. And it grew from five, six people to like 5,000 members now, which includes a lot of startups, uh, investors, uh, media, and students, things like that. So it's similar to what's happening here in Singapore. Um, I'm, we're tracking about 300 startups right now in Hong Kong. Um, there's about 10 to 15 that have gotten a lot of uh, you know, multi-million dollar investments. Um, mostly not from Hong Kong, so they've gone overseas to get it. 9gag.com is one of the more famous international brands out of Hong Kong. Um, they raised three million outside of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, so it's, it's growing now. Um, I like to tell people that uh, January 2012, we had about 1,000 square feet of co-work space. And uh, this late last year, we had about 100,000 square feet of co-work space in, in different venues around 
Hong Kong, until I went to see this guy's office, and they have 100,000 square feet in one, one place in Beijing. So, so I, it's not that impressive anymore. Um, uh, so we're seeing now this 2013 to be a big year. Um, obviously, mobile games are hot. It's, everything is hot, e-commerce, things like that. Um, we see the angel community growing bigger this year. Um, luckily, in my uh, also I work for SoftLayer as an, a kind of an ambassador, so I'm able to go around the different cities, startup cities in Asia, and see what's happening. And I see a lot of interest in Hong Kong this year, so I think that's going to be good for us. Um, two kinds of startups in Hong Kong. I think ones that are sit around complain about not finding any money, and the ones that go out there and look for the money. I want to give a props out to two startups from Hong Kong here. The lots of button guy you saw yesterday. Did a great job. Everybody's snickering at the idea, right? But then the, the pitch, pretty awesome. So th those kind of startups are going to do well, I think. The ones that find those unique solutions um, to different things that people don't normally do. Um, we don't need any more check-in apps, um, but they seem to keep making them. Um, and of course, social agent, uh, taking, taking control of Weibo for Western people doing marketing there. So I think that those are two great, and they're here. So they like, actually came out to, to promote and pitch um, in here in Singapore. Um, but uh, yeah. It, they seem, and I also find the Hong Kong startups a bit, a bit arrogant. They don't want to go to China, and they don't want to go to Southeast Asia. So they think in going to the West, um, and uh, so to the Pacific Ocean, exactly. <laughs> so um, that's a bit of an education issue that I found. Um, and actually, the third, third uh, Hong Kong startup has moved to Singapore to tap into the money here. So um, that's another thing. So that's nutshell there. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris. Um, I'm part of the Innovation Works team based in, in Beijing, so with the caveat that you have a Greek talking to you about uh, China, <laughs> I'll do my very best to, to, to give a little bit of a Laowai perspective on what's happening in, in China. Just a quick intro for Innovation Works. We are a seed and early stage uh, uh, venture firm uh, that is trying to do things a little bit different in, uh, in the Chinese uh, tech ecosystem. Uh, because uh, we don't only just uh, seed and, and finance uh, startup companies uh, uh, sequentially, but we, we also have a very large physical space that Casey just uh, spoke about. So a lot of our uh, portfolio companies are at least initially for the first six to nine months or even up to a year uh, actually uh, co-located in, inside our space. It's 8,000 square meters in Beijing and another 8,000 square meters in, in Shanghai. We also have, uh, and I heard the, the Rocket Internet gentleman earlier this morning talking about that, a, a very f uh, operational team. So we have about 16 operations professionals, but we have about 31, uh, um, sorry, 16 investment professionals, but we have a 31 operational professionals. So we have in-house legal team, uh, accounting team. We have 11 people just doing recruiting alone for the startups and so on. Why? because the Chinese ecosystem uh, for startups necessitates, at least at this moment in time, to be offering entrepreneurs uh, this kind of assistance in, in the beginning uh, for good or, or for bad. Uh, we also manage quite a bit of capital. We have at the moment about $500 million uh, under management, so this is not exactly your typical uh, seed and early stage uh, fund size. That, that allows us to, to keep investing in our portfolio companies from seed all the way to series B and beyond if they're really performing well and, and they, they're, they're basically uh, fulfilling their potential. So China or Chinese internet. I think uh, the, the two sentence summary is probably the most explosive and rapidly changing and rapidly growing uh, tech ecosystem in the world at the moment. Uh, very different from the rest of the countries in, in this uh, Southeast Asia region, very different from the US, but converging with, with, with Silicon Valley. Nowhere near at the moment with, with the Silicon Valley uh, maturity, but, but getting there. Already in the last two, three years, there's, there's, there's been a lot of very big changes, and I'm just going to try to give a few uh, brief highlights and stop me when you think I'm speaking too much about China, because I can be speaking for the full 40 minutes about it. So. Let me just tell you uh, two or three major changes just, just from the last two or three years. First of all, uh, there is uh, a confluence of mobile, social, and e-commerce that in, at least in the US has happened kind of sequentially, but in China is happening at the same time. And everything is going towards the mobile internet space. And it has created tremendous opportunities, especially given also the absence of Google uh, from the local Chinese market. So let me just give you some very practical examples. We have gone from zero to 150 million Android devices in just two years, two and a half years to be precise. 
uh, Weixin, which uh, WeChat, as, as it's known outside of, uh, of China, has gone from zero to 200 million users in less than two years. Weibo went from zero to 300 million users in, 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 in just short of three years. Uh, and, and you know, you hear a lot of stories that have amazing numbers. There's a question about monetization in a lot of the, of the products at the moment in China. But then there are other sectors that are monetizing like nothing we've ever seen before. So just to give you a practical example from the e-commerce uh, space, uh, most of you guys know in the U.S. The, the meaning of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which happens at the end of November, right? Uh, and collectively, in the last, uh, the last Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the, the, the U.S. transactional volume in e-commerce was about a, a billion and a half uh, in these two days. In China, on the, what we call the Singles Day, the 11th of November, which is a completely new kind of shopping holiday, uh, because obviously it's 11th, 11th, right? Uh, the transactional volume this past year was $4 billion in one day, half of it on Taobao alone. So you, you can see that, uh, you know, there are other sectors, of course, that are finding it extremely hard to, 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 to monetize. Another very big difference that have happened in, uh, which affect startups and affect entrepreneurship in the, last, uh, in the last two, three years are up until now, the, the four or five very big Chinese internet companies who were functioning a lot like startups are now functioning a lot more like big corporates. I'm talking about Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Chihu 360, uh, Sina, Sohu, and, and Netiz, and, and, and so on, all publicly listed outside of, of China. Hundreds of billions of dollars in capitalization. For the first time, they're actually having structured corporate development and M&A departments and are starting to do acquisitions rather than killing staff, uh, uh, startups and suffocating them to death, which is what a lot of the, the past history of Chinese ecosystem uh, was about. Uh, and that is wonderful news for us since an early stage investors. Innovation Works alone has already sold three of its earlier stage uh, portfolio companies uh, in, in, in companies that, that I mentioned uh, before. There, there is a sense that product and talent acquisition, which is so prevalent at the moment in Silicon Valley, is finally happening in China too, which is good news. But not everything is good news because on the flip side, these very large Chinese internet companies are now competing with each other in pretty much every single uh, space of the consumer internet and mobile internet space. It used to be that everyone had their own little vertical protected silo, so Baidu was in search. Um, Sina had the, 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 the portal. Um, Alibaba had the e-commerce outgoing and, and, uh, and C2C with, uh, with Taobao, the Alipay with the, with the, the, the payments. Uh, and Tencent pretty much had everything else and is the one that was, was monetizing and probably the more mighty of, of, of all of these companies. They've now entered each other space. Add that Chihu 360's uh, meteoric rise in the last, um, in the last uh, two to three years, at the Weibo phenomenon, the Weixin phenomenon. So the question is, as a startup entrepreneur, where do I squeeze in? in between all these uh, giants. And even if I see an opportunity today and I rush very quickly and I'm a very good entrepreneur also, I can, I can execute, what tells me that in three or four months I'm not going to be uh, you know, attacked by one of these because somebody will get an interest. Now, the more positive side is that finally you have a chance of selling early, but you're also not in a very good negotiating position because these companies don't yet have the mentality of the American companies in, in acquiring talent and, and the economics are not yet Silicon Valley type of, of, uh, of economics. Uh, one last point is we finally also have a little bit more mature early stage investment uh, uh, environment. Uh, we have a little bit more mature uh, angel uh, investment uh, ecosystem. Uh, six years ago when I arrived in Beijing, I was trying to find people to, to, to because I'm doing also some personal angel investments to, to co-invest with and it was almost impossible to, to, to find. Right now we have the first few super angels uh, phenomena in, uh, in China, and these are usually local people. Uh, and now that I mentioned local, maybe one last point is that uh, China is unfortunately for us foreigners a v a increasingly becoming local and a very, very difficult place as, as, a, as, a, local as a foreign entrepreneur or as a foreign investor for, for, that, uh, for that part to actually uh, operate in, right? Because there is ton tons of Chinese talent all over the world the majority of, uh, of all the great Silicon Valley companies that you all know of uh, have at all levels Chinese engineers, Chinese product managers. And uh, for the most part, these guys, after especially they make the first bit of money, they all want to go back. 
and they want to they, they see the opportunity of their homeland and they are much more qualified to, to operate in, in China than I am or, or anyone who's not, not, not Chinese. Uh, so it is becoming an increasingly uh, complicated and, and uh, difficult environment in a very local environment. Okay, thanks Chris. That, that actually leads me a bit to my, my next question for you guys. Um, so it's clear that there's a, hello? a startup wave uh, going across Asia right now and arguably for the last decade uh, and each ecosystem is at a very different level of maturity. Uh, when I looked at the demographics of the audience here, uh, it's mostly entrepreneurs and startups. And so one question for, I know a lot of these guys is around funding and the funding ecosystems. I mean, I get, I, I, not a day goes by in Singapore where I get an entrepreneur ask me, you know, where's the best place to put their business? Uh, what about funding? You know, in, in Singapore we have this issue where there's a ton of, uh, because the government programs, we've got a ton of seed stage investment, and then there's sort of Death Valley after that, and we've got nothing in the sort of Series A, B, and, and C ranges. Um, if you guys can just give us, I know Chris, you gave us a little bit of insight on, on what's happening uh, within China and having the earlier stages, but a little more insight from each of you guys on the other markets on what's happening in terms of the, the VC ecosystems uh, in each of your respective countries. Uh, I, I think that the, because I you know, see the you know, startup, the community, the VC ecosystem the, almost across the Asia, so the, I think in terms of the, you know, the financial capital for the startups, obviously China is the, obviously the best one. Because the, say like uh, I think the 2011, you know the total amount of the, the venture capital investment in China actually is close to eight billion US dollars, but that you know the, the amount the, in the same time in Japan is through one billion US dollars, what? one billion yeah. So that you know the, the uh, in that sense you know the, the the pool of the investors of the venture capital as well as the uh, angel investors in China, uh, it seems to be you know the by far the you know the deep the deeper. The, the deepest uh, compared with the other, you know, the Asian uh, so, the so let me say market. You've got Japan and China, arguably about the same overall GDP, yeah. um, but you have eight times the, and, and you have a much higher cost infrastructure like, for starting like, a company in like, Japan. Like, like. But you have one eighth the amount of like. early stage capital. Right. That's not good. And, and to put it into perspective, it is uh, uh, the China uh, VC invested capital and, and funds raised in general is about one third of the US. Uh, so to put it in perspective, but that gap is closing. So actually uh, for Chinese VC funds uh, in the past two, three years has been relatively easier to fundraise from international, yeah, from international LPs compared to their Silicon Valley counterparts. Uh, of course, it's a little bit of a joke given that uh, Silicon Valley uh, VCs are in Fund 7, Fund 8, Fund 9. There are, of course, a few new players, but they have a lot more track record. They have a lot more history. They have a lot more uh, seasoned uh, GPs, whereas the entire uh, VC industry in China is no longer than 10 years, and the vast majority of, of fund teams, including ours, actually are very new uh, into this business and have very little or no track record to, uh, to, to, to speak of. But it's the China promise. So international... Uh, International LPs and institutional investors see this as a as tremendous growth potential, which is true. It exists, uh, and uh, a lot of money has gone into China in uh, in, in the past three four years. So, uh, Sanji, uh, obviously China is at, we see at one end of the spectrum, the, the most mature in, in Asia in terms of the funding ecosystem. Um, I look at one of my investors, Sequoia, as a good barometer. You know, they went into China first. Well, actually, they went to Israel first. But in Asia, they went into China first. Uh, and then they set up shop in India and, and seem to be growing quite well there. What's the ecosystem? And, and the other thing I also notice a lot with the Indian investors is, uh, you know, having Sequoia India and Sequoia U.S. as investors in us, uh, one's always telling me to grow, 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 hire the most expensive people, build a team out. And the other side is trying to get me to EBITDA, uh, cash flow positive as fast as possible, and hire guys for two lakhs each. So... Um, you know, what, what insight can you give us on the Indian uh, sure. VC? So there's a fundamental difference um, between 
the Indian VC mindset and the US VC mindset. And that's a function of the exit options that you have. In the US, you have a lot of exit options which come under the talent acquisition and the product acquisition categories. In India, a lot of the exit options, uh, the smaller exit co options are usually startups buying other startups. The bigger exit options are usually uh, MNCs coming into India and buying startups. And when that happens, the first metric that they look for is revenue, is uh, actual business. Uh, you won't find an Instagram story happening in India. 13 people getting bought for 1 billion, I don't think that's ever going to happen. So because the exit scenario is different, it peters down all the way, probably stops around Series B because below that there's a lot of mindless funding happening. But till Series B, it's all about exit, how, how's the exit going to happen. There's a lot of angel funding happening in India right now. Um, and angel funding is extremely powerful. Uh, huge number of... Um, you know, uh, startups not going anywhere, but most of the angel fund, angel investors usually think of a Series P exit, so that's how it works for them. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot in India is uh, intra-fund acquisitions. So a, f a fund basically invests in two different companies. One of them is not working out, so you transfer the money to your, uh, the, you transfer bad money to make it good money, and uh, a, a lot of that has been happening as well. So. That's okay. really the key difference that I see between the two mindsets. So, uh, Jamie, you've got me um, quite interested and in I'm wanting to move to Taiwan now because uh, the cost per, uh, I, I shouldn't say it too loud because a lot of my employees are in the audience, but um, if I could pay them about a fourth of what I'm paying them here in uh, Singapore, that's, that's we'd be profitable today. So, uh, what, what about the funding ecosystem? Uh, so, uh, like I said yesterday morning, uh, traditionally Taiwan, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago was one of the biggest VC uh, uh, industries in the world. And you know, uh, even though it's not been growing for the past 10 years, we still, the, the remnants of that is still pretty large. So we have 120 GPs, more than 200 funds, more than 200 LPs, uh, more than 50 billion under management right now. So, uh, but most of that, you know, uh, the, the GPs are more focused on the uh, high tech manufacturing, IC design, uh, a side of the business because uh, traditionally Taiwan is known for you know a, 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 a high tech manufacturing hub. Uh, there are a lot fewer VCs that get the internet game. That's where we come into play. So you know, uh, oftentimes we're serving as the financial. We're both serving as the investor and also the financial advi uh, advisor to our portfolio in that when they're ready to raise their Series B, C, D runs, we work as a bridge in between them to the capital market. So we're educating the 120 GPs on how they should look at internet companies and how should they should value internet companies. And we've been uh, finding quite some success in doing that. Okay. Um, Casey, any VCs in... Uh so what I'm seeing right now, or what I'm hearing mostly, is that there's starting to get more competitive amongst angels, but there are a lot of VCs in Hong Kong because it's such a financial center that there, I think we'll have a better chance at going through Series A and Series B in Hong Kong because when people are looking at $1 million deals, it's not big enough for them. So I think that that might be something good for Hong Kong in the long run, yep. where other countries will come in and try and go, go and get the money from that way. So now flipping it a little, a lot of entrepreneurs are also, as they're out in Southeast Asia, they're trying to think about what countries to go after, where to base their countries, uh, where to base their operations. Uh, Singapore has attracted a lot of foreign talent. There's a little bit of a uh, political backlash going on right now. And so a lot of, I know a lot of entrepreneurs here are starting to think about where else they might want to look at. Um, how, when I think of India and China, I think of them as domestic first sort of focused markets. I'm not sure about Taiwan, given the, some of the stuff you've said. Um, and I think about Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, the domestic market's so small, you have to look out immediately. Uh, Japan, I also think of as, as quite insular. Um, what, if, if there's entrepreneurs here that are trying to struggle with where to start their business, where to scale it out, where to build it, are there, A, in your respective countries, certain clusters or ecosystems that, Jamie, you just touched on that a bit, um, that are stronger, that, that your ecosystems are better for? And B, uh, are there barriers, like Chris, you were talking about being a foreign entrepreneur in China is, is getting more and more difficult? 
So India has very specific clusters. Uh, Bangalore is one of the top clusters, if I could put it that way, because uh, Bangalore is where the IT services boom started, so a lot of the talent started flowing in there. And uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad are coming up as well. So within India, those are the clusters. Now, when I think of uh, startups coming out of India, there are two very distinct categories of startups. There are those who are solving a very India-specific pain and a very emerging market specific pain and <clears throat> they clearly have to be in India, they clearly need to be near the market. There are those that are solving a more uh, global problem or they, their first adopters are going to be external or the people who are going to fund them are going to be outside India. So we, we're seeing a lot of uh, funding coming from the US, essentially asking people to relocate to the US. So it's either funding or it's where's your customer, if it's an enterprise SaaS company, it's better in the US if it's media buying, it's probably better in Singapore, so companies are relocating because of that. So it's usually these factors that are going into where you set up operations. As far as you're solving an India consumer market problem, you're building something like Redbus, Ziptile, which, are, which would never exist in the US, very India specific, it, it's, it's something that starts so out. Specifically on India, one wave that I'm definitely seeing over the past six months alone is so many, uh, not just legal entities, but executive teams coming from India to Singapore and setting up a parent company here in Singapore. I don't know why my microphone keeps going in and out. But uh, setting up a, a legal entity here and bringing the CEO over, CFO, it starts at small and it, and it grows bigger. But uh, it's almost like they're trying to legitimize their international opportunities by uh, coming over. I know at least a half a dozen Sequoia India companies have come over in the last six months alone. So w what is that? What's going on there? I think there are three different kinds of reasons that Indian companies are coming out here. The, probably the not so good reason is just the tax uh, you know, evasion. Uh, That's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. my, my company is not profitable, but I have to pay 15% sure. tax. I got to show 15% profitability in India no matter what. And sure. I say, but we're not profitable. But the government says, I don't care. You're still paying 15% tax. Yeah. So, so that, that's happening quite a bit. The other thing that's happening a lot is, you know, essentially, how do you prove your concept? How do you prove your initial product with a set of customers so that you can pitch that back to India saying that, uh, back to an in, a, a Indian uh, enterprise saying that this is what works out there. It can work for you as well. So we're seeing that happening, especially in ad networks because uh, media spend towards mobile advertising is very, very low in India. So cases where you cannot prove the concept in India itself, they're probably moving out here in Singapore where there's a lot of media buying going on. And in a very few cases, as I mentioned, the investors are over here, they feel that they need to be closer to the, uh, to the operators, to the entrepreneurs. So they're bringing out the leadership here because of cost reasons, the engineering team stays back in India. That model is still, you know, uh, not fully proven, but uh, that's something that's happening as well. Kirigawasan? Uh, I I think you know the, because the the, the part because the you know the we actually fo mainly focus on the B two C the consumer the internet services so that the most of our you know so the targeting company actually choose the first you know focus on the local market because the the you know if actually you the the, the provide you know the B two C services that the, you know the, the I I believe that you know you have to be close to the customers. So that you know that is why the, the you know the we actually prefer the, these kind of the startups when we actually decide to make investment. Also, the I also think that you know still the most of the the, the entrepreneurs back in Japanese market has the same kind of the, the idea. Of course, they eventually the, the the want to expand their business in Southeast Asia or other countries. But they also recognize that you know first we have to establish a good business basement in local market if you really target at B two C services. But is there a lot of gaijin entrepreneurs? in Japan? There are, but I say there's still pretty few, I think. Okay. Mm. Um, so one, one thing that, that, uh, that's been interesting, we've been seeing over the last, uh, we saw maybe two years ago, three years ago started, is as the yen grew quite strong, we saw a lot of Japanese companies coming down, uh, Greed, DNA, 
uh, NEC, they all had their VC funds, Cyber Agent, coming down, making investments in Southeast Asia. We definitely saw a strong wave. Obviously, the yen has is, is lost a lot of its value over the last six months, and, and some of those companies have made some acquisitions that were, uh, didn't go so well. And so we've seen a little bit of, it just feels like retrenchment. Um, but now we're starting to see, as Chris, you highlighted, uh, the Japanese or the, the Chinese companies, the big players are all getting corp dev teams and M and A uh, led strategies, and we're starting to see them starting to set up shop in Singapore and look into Indonesia and so forth. Uh, is this wave uh, just a bubble, and, and are they going to try to grow organically? Are they going to do M and A? Are they going to come down and give us Chinese uh, deflated valuations and copy of us copy us if we don't take the money? You know what's going on with that. I think they're trying to figure it out at the moment, but uh, I would say that I would place, I would put my money behind the Chinese uh, companies. I think at the moment in, in, in Southeast Asia is a little bit of a land grab. The Koreans and, and the Japanese saw it first and they probably needed it most. Uh, the Chinese are a little bit more patient and a little bit more wary of, uh, they don't know exactly how to internationalize just yet. But having said that, there are Tencent uh, for sure is already m moving with very, very large strides internationally. And I would make a couple of arguments in favor of a lot more increased presence uh, as kind of as a prediction, not, not as, a, as a support of Chinese companies being a lot more prevalent in this region uh, in, uh, in the next few years for, for two to three reasons. First of all, I think the, Ch the Chinese consumer, the Chinese end user, because we're always talking about mobile internet, consumer internet uh, products, is actually much closer uh, to, the so to the typical, as much as you can group the Southeast Asian countries' uh, uh, user behavior uh, than, uh, than I think the Japanese for sure, and to a lesser extent the, 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 the Korean ones. Chinese companies understand how to build products for users who do not want to pay a single cent of a dollar if they can afford to. Mian feida, mian feida, mian feida in everything. Uh, and uh, they also uh, build products that are much more uh, social. They build products that are much more uh, entertaining because that's what the whole internet space is, is in China. It's affordable entertainment for, for young people with very little or zero, near zero consumer spending power. So I think they understand, they'll be able to relate. They're, bu they're building products that I think are going to be able to relate to the user base in Southeast Asia better. I can give you a very small practical example. I haven't used Kakao Token and Line, but I use Weixing on an on a, on a hourly basis. So um, uh, there is a function on Weixing, which I'm not sure if Kakao Talk has or Line, but for sure they didn't when they initially started with, which is see who's around you. We call it the booty call button. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> or you can call it whatever you like. <laughs> different people d use it for different purposes. <laughs> but, but by the way, it's the reason Weixin is the only one of those apps that has a 17 plus year old rating. You notice everyone else is four yeah. years plus, but. Yeah, well, uh, but that it, it illustrates my point, right? Yeah. That, that the Chinese companies are building products that I think will speak to the heart of the Indonesian user, the Thai user, the Vietnamese user, the Filipino user much better. And, and you know, at least they'll, 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 they also are extremely ruthless, moving fast type of companies, very scrappy entrepreneurs, and they have this kind of mentality because they've been brought up in an extremely competitive market. So when they go, when they finally decide to go out for and, 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 and go, go for something, they, they do it with, with all their might. The third reason is they have a lot more cash than everybody else. So when they are going to decide to put that cash to use in, in this region, you know, this is something that I think everybody should, should be uh, aware of. So to give you practical examples, Alibaba has a, a $500 million evergreen fund that they're putting to, towards work uh, in terms of acquisitions at the moment. Uh, Tencent has publicly, uh, Pony Ma has publicly uh, announced, I think a year ago or so, that for the next two to three years he has earmarked one billion dollars for acquisitions and, and for strategic investments, including for international expansion. They have entire departments now which are looking uh, for targets. Um, and, uh, and Baidu, uh, you know, Baidu did the, the, the first and largest uh, to date M&A 
uh, a year and a half ago when they bought the Chunar, the, the kayak of China for uh, I think 60% for $300 million or something like that. So although they haven't announced their strategy in a very specific way, you can, you, you can, you can rest assured that they have plans. And they did send a whole team, I think, last May uh, or last June in Southeast Asia to, to start understanding the market. So I would personally put my bet eventually uh, on, on the Chinese companies doing things, but personally also as an angel investor here in, in, in Southeast Asia, I would very, very much like to see, I mean, the phenomenon of having foreigners from more advanced, from more sophisticated markets going into more nascent markets has happened many, many times before uh, all over the world, including Silicon Valley when it first started. Even today, Silicon Valley is the largest talent pool accumulation from all over the world. It's not just Americans building companies in Silicon Valley. So the, the, the issue, though, is here what we should all be wanting to, to, to see happening is a lot more native entrepreneurs, a lot more local entrepreneurs, because at the end of the day, nobody understands your fellow compatriot, your, your, your neighborhood people, your high school friends, your, you know, your co-workers better than, than the, the local person. So uh, eventually, hopefully, uh, we're going to see a lot more local investors and a lot more local entrepreneurs. So we we got to close up here, but I got one question for each of you quickly. Um, we've been talking a lot about your countries. Now, since we are here in Singapore and in, in Southeast Asia, I just want to know what the, it, it's always interesting for me, I have to go back to the Valley every other month for our board meetings, and the reputation of Singapore has changed and evolved quite a bit over the last five, six years, I noticed, in the Valley. Um, no thanks to a lot of the, uh, the government-funded um, uh, press that they've put in a lot of the tech blogs there, but uh, just kind of curious at what's the perspective from each of your, your perspective countries on, on Singapore or Southeast Asia as a whole? Just quickly. Nobody wants to touch this. <laughs> yeah, actually, just ignore these people out here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, I think Singapore has a, a place in the Southeast Asia ecosystem. Uh, it is a, it's obviously, and everybody knows, it's a very small domestic uh, market. It is not a good test market like EDB or, or a lot of other government agencies, at least in the past, used to say, because it's actually a very, very different uh, marketplace, uh, a very different user base compared to, so it's not actually, it's the opposite. Uh, but it's a very, very good place to serve as a regional headquarter. It's a very good place, just like, again, the government says, to, to put the IP. Uh, it is a self-selection process also because a lot of the foreign talent does come here, partly also for lifestyle uh, reasons, not, not always uh, because the domestic market is, is the best. I personally am not a very big fan of, I'm, I'm a very big fan of the intentions of the government here in terms of helping to sparehead the whole ecosystem, help helping to get people uh, started and pushing them into an entrepreneurial uh, avenue, but I'm, I'm not a very big fan of all the government funding schemes here. I think the market should be dictating economics and, and, and entrepreneurship should be coming from the young people, from all of you guys uh, uh, here, because of an indigenous and, and an honest appetite to, to start up and not because somebody is giving you free money or somebody uh, is, is you know, giving some, some uh, investors free money to, to, to invest. So I don't, it, there's a lot of government-driven entrepreneurial activity here. I would like to see a lot more honest, uh, uh, market-driven entrepreneurial activity uh, coming out here. I think Property Guru, of which I've been very fortunate to be part of as an angel investor, is a great story, which is going to make, make the real headlines, I think, in, uh, in, in the region about how to build a very successful venture out of Singapore and, and into, the, into the Southeast Asian market. And Casey, what does uh, I, well, our I, I little sister Hong Kong think? Yeah. Well, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore are always fighting each other, right? <laughs> and the Singaporeans come to Hong Kong and they always say, we're the best. And I'm here, I'm like, we're the best. So it's always a good, uh, good thing. But I think, like Chris is saying about the, um, the government support here, I think that um, one thing it does definitely does is it ups the game in the region for us, especially in Hong Kong. When you hear what Singapore is doing, uh, the government's doing, um, it makes our government a bit like, ooh, what, we got to do something too. So you see all the different agencies scurrying around trying to do something to spur it on their own without having a big subsidy from the government for, for startups. Because, you know, Hong Kong was really, f you know, just like Singapore, was really f founded by entrepreneurs, right? Um, you know, everybody knows Lee Ka-shing did so much stuff all by himself. So I think the government says, well, if they can do it by himself, then you can do it by yourself, right? It's always like that, and I think uh, in, in that terms, um, yeah, the strong survive. Um, like Chris saying, if, if, 
if the government's giving money, then a lot of people can just like have not really strong ideas, but can get funding. In Hong Kong, if you, you know, six months, if you're not getting traction, it's over, right? And maybe that's for the best, right? Um, and, then, and then also spur people to look outside Hong Kong immediately instead of trying to find a market there and, and going to China um, fast, sooner than later or looking at other markets faster than trying to build um, whatever is in Hong Kong with such a small group. What, Jamie, what do the Taiwanese think? Um, I, have to, I have to agree with Casey that uh, you know, uh, by Singaporean government doing so much you know, uh, uh, it's also, you know, sort of uh, uh, making our, our government think that they should do a little bit more. Um, in terms of um, how we view this, uh, 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 this, uh, this area, uh, I think for most Taiwanese uh, internet startups or internet companies, we're increasingly viewing uh, Southeast Asia as our, you know, more logical uh, destination for expansion. So, you know, with me on this trip is, you know, several Taiwanese you know, uh, you know, more successful entrepreneurs that are considering setting up a headquarter here. So I would agree with Chris that it's a really reasonable place to set up a regional headquarter. Sanjeev? I'll just step away from the government debate. I'll, uh, I think, uh, you know, for uh, any s uh, country to develop a good uh, breeding place for startups, you need three things. You need entrepreneurial talent, you need uh, a good investment climate, and you need good mentorship. You need the PayPal mafia at scale. You need somebody, you need a generation of entrepreneurs who've already done it from that country and can uh, support and mentor the next group. And that's what we're seeing happening a lot in India and China because of people who have done it internally as well as people who've done it in the valley and returning home. That's what is missing in Singapore at this point. And once that comes in with uh, you know, companies like your, yours as well, who've got good traction, that, that, that's probably something that's missing in Singapore right now that'll take it to the next level. Okay, and uh, the Japanese, what do they think? Although, I gotta admit, our perspective in, Sing in Singapore and the mm -hmm. Japanese is they always come here for two years and then they go home. Yeah, uh, how to say, but, <laughs> but still I think the, the for, for the Japanese companies, you know, the Southeast Asia is still the very, the, how to say, the attractive market and still in Japan, very strong momentum to going into the Southeast Asia. Of course, the, in Asia, you know, the for Japanese company, you know, the biggest market is either China or Southeast Asia. But uh, the, I think particularly in the IT industry, the Japanese company already recognized that China is very big, but uh, maybe too late and too competitive. So that the, for the most of Japanese company, they actually the, still thinking that Southeast, Southeast Asia should be a more you know, the opportunity. So that, the, the, you know, as you said, like, uh, you know, the, the, I think a few years ago, it's kind of the first wave for Japanese company to come to Southeast Asia. But I still believe that, you know, that kind of momentum is still strong, actually. Okay. Good, good. That's good to hear. So uh, let's give these guys a round of applause. Uh, thank you.